Hello everyone and welcome to the Battle of Aldi custom multiplayer game, episode 6. In part 5, we went over the cavalry action occurring on the northern part of the battlefield. We talked about the stalemate going on around Aldi itself. And we looked at McDowell's right flank being threatened by Jackson's corps moving around to that side. That has brought us to the 1 p.m. staff meetings. This is the first open discussions the sides have had since 11 a.m., and the last they're going to have until 3 p.m. For the 1 p.m. union discussion, Banks spoke up first. Longstreet is trying to press through my line north of the Aldi perimeter. He knows I have less favorable terrain there. My plan is to gradually fall back through the woods, reducing the effect of his artillery unless he moves it into the woods, and ultimately move a few guns in the woods myself as the line approaches Aldi. Pope felt that Banks had the situation under control, and that the attack on Aldi was a sideshow to the main Confederate effort at Gilbert's Corner. McDowell disagreed, though. The attack on Aldi is, I believe, the main effort. I will be most surprised if the rebels even attempt to launch a major assault across McDowell's and Siegel's front at this time. McDowell felt that the rebels were just tying down federal forces at Gilbert's Corner to increase their odds of success at Aldi where the main attack was headed. McDowell was determined to hold his lines around Gilbert's Corner, though his right flank was crumbling as Jackson's division outflanked Milroy's brigade. McDowell sought some assistance from Banks to hold his right flank until more men could be sent to support the right. Once that right was solidified, then he would send some reinforcements to Aldi to aid Banks against the attack he felt sure was coming there. Pope was not convinced the main enemy attack was heading for Aldi, and so declined to order Banks to send assistance to McDowell's right flank. He would leave the decision up to Banks whether to send assistance to McDowell's flank if he felt he could spare the men. For the 1 p.m. Union orders, simply there were no orders issued. All commanders would continue to defend their areas of the battlefield as best they could. For the 1 p.m. Rebel discussion, Lee began the discussion much in the same way he did the previous discussion at 11 o'clock. I'm still befuddled on what the Union is trying to achieve as they continue to be pushed back, mostly out into the open. The situation on Fitz Lee's front was also addressed as Lee stated that why on earth they have a small brigade and a few guns north of Goose Creek is bizarre. I was going to take those guns, but now that their cavalry has ventured north across Little River, I'll deal with them first. Lee felt an attack on Aldi might succeed and contemplated ordering Longstreet to assault the town from the west. On Jackson's and Hill's front, all seemed to be progressing well. Lee only advised them to be wary of the open fields as they pushed onward for Gilbert's Corner. Hill then spoke next. Hill believed the Federals had been draining manpower from Aldi throughout the morning to reinforce Gilbert's Corner's defenses. Actually, this is incorrect, but it is a reasonable assumption given what's going on around the battlefield. Because of the belief that Aldi was being weakened, Hill supported the idea of an attack against Aldi. Much like Lee, though, Hill was stumped by many of the Union movements and decisions during the battle. Hill concluded that one early thought was that the Yanks might just dig in around Aldi and Gilbert's corner, and wait for us to advance into their guns. Although not terribly innovative, that may have been what they were reduced to after we had a quick advance east of the mountains and they felt they were compelled to counter. Under the theory of Occam's razor, the simplest solution is usually the most likely. Jackson spoke last. He felt the situation around Aldi was still too unknown to feel confident that an attack could succeed. He urged increased scouting before any assault was launched. Jackson also brought up the possibility of recalling Fitzley's cavalrymen and using them to help Longstreet isolate and pin Banks in place at Aldi. If his own corps could reach the turnpike between Aldi and Gilbert's Corner, 
then they might be able to isolate and capture all of the Federals at Aldi. Jackson was unsure about a direct attack on Gilbert's Corner just yet. He would continue to advance on McDowell's right flank and let the situation continue to develop more. For the 1 p.m. rebel orders, Fitz Lee would either fight and attack the Yankee cavalry if they desired a battle in the open fields, or if the Yankees declined to fight, then to keep fighting them north of Goose Creek. Longstreet would not attack until he could get more eyes around the town of Aldi. But if an opportunity presented itself, then he would not hesitate to move. Hill and Jackson would keep advancing on both flanks of the Federals south of Gilbert's Corner. I see no reason to change what has been a winning strategy thus far. Continue to advance on the Union left and right, and, above all, use terrain to our best advantage and do not advance large bodies of men into the open. If we do that, they will disorder and rout, and any such instances on our side will be minimal. They will probably make some mistakes, and then opportunities will arise for us. Now we're going to look at the end of the 1 p.m. turn. And during this turn, Milroy was captured, along with two of his units, on the Federal right flank. Altogether, they lost about 1,000 men during this turn. In the north, Buford fell back. Rather than taking on the Confederates between Goose Creek and Little River, Buford decided to fall back to his original positions and await any sort of Confederate actions. Drayton continues his march northward. Drayton's large brigade, which was dispatched from Jones's division a few hours ago, is continuing its march along the mountain road to join the remainder of Longstreet's corps now around Aldi. 1.20 p.m. now, and more of Milroy's brigade has been isolated on the Federal right flank. The Federal flank is simply being rolled up as the Confederates continue to move around it. And we're going to zoom in here on that part of the map, and you can see very easily that the Confederates are in control of this side of the map and are systematically just isolating and bagging Federal regiments on the Union right flank. There is a Union counterattack being launched on the opposite flank, though, as a Union brigade has marched through the woods to attack the Confederate right flank. And this is not an ideal attack situation for the Federals. They're moving against a Confederate line, which is in the woods and on higher ground, and so I'm not really sure what they're going to accomplish by launching this counterattack. 1.40 p.m. now and the front moves closer to Gilbert's Corner. The Confederates continue to put pressure all along the line and drive the Federals back hex by hex as they move towards Gilbert's Corner. Federals outflanked, except it's on the other flank now. Where the Federals just counterattacked, they ended up being counterattacked themselves by a larger Confederate force, which has managed to get around their flank and actually isolate 400 men. But... Spoiler alert, the Federals would actually escape this trap. But let's go ahead and zoom in on what's going on there. So here you can see that the Confederates of Kemper's division are counterattacking against the Federals of Butterfield's brigade, which had actually just launched their own attack last turn. The Confederates were able to sneak in a unit around the Federal left flank and managed to isolate this unit here. They would, however, be able to escape this trap and live to fight another day. 2 p.m., and the Confederates continue to work around McDowell's right flank. And let's go ahead and pull up the map here and view what's going on. So here you can see Gilbert's Corner and Aldi on the map, along with the Little River, which separates the two. In the northwest, around Aldi itself, we have the two divisions of Longstreet's Corps, while to the south, we have Jackson's division and Ewell's division of Jackson's Corps. And over in the east, we have Hill's Corps. Countering them is Banks at Aldi, with McDowell at Gilbert's Corner, and Siegel on the left flank of the Federal Army. The main line of contention right now is right about here between the Federals and the Confederates. Those open fields have slowed the Confederate attack, but they continue to look for 
ideal artillery positions, and cover within the woods themselves in order to inch forward against the Federal line. But the main Confederate effort is being launched against the Federal right flank of McDowell's force. The Confederates continue to put pressure on Milroy's brigade and any other Federal units in this area, and are simply routing them and pushing them back away from this side. The real threat, though, to the Federal Army is this force here. Right now, they are moving along a trail, and if they are able to use that trail and then move through the woods, there's a chance they could reach the turnpike, which links Aldi to Gobert's Corner. If they are able to do this, there's every reason to believe that they could isolate and probably capture all of Banks's corps around Aldi. In which case, of course, this battle comes to a quick close. Whether or not the Federals can stop them in time, we're going to have to wait and see. During the action on this flank, Brigadier General Truman Seymour was wounded in action. 2.20 p.m. now, and the Confederates just keep wearing them down on the Federal right flank. The action there is nonstop, and they continue to work around, route, and damage McDowell's right flank. But really, everywhere else along the lines, the offensive has been halted. While the Federals don't necessarily have the best positions, they are still strong. And for the Confederates to reach them now, they have no choice but to move across open fields. So the real area of movement now is basically confined to Jackson's left flank, which is trying to get around McDowell's right flank. 2.40 p.m. now, and as I said before, the battlefield is mostly static. There's still long-range firing going on and the occasional flare-up of musketry, but the action is really confined to that area between Jackson's division and McDowell's right flank. And in that fighting, Brigadier General George Meade was wounded in action, and the rebels just continue to work around McDowell's right flank. But they are running into a problem, and that problem is simply that they have too few men available for this movement. And we're going to zoom in on this part of the map so you can see what I'm talking about. When you just look at the map itself, it looks really bad for the Federals. And it seems that the Confederates are in a really good position to get around their right flank and cause havoc. Well, when you actually start counting up the numbers of men, it gets a little bit different. So in this area here, circled, this is part of Banks's core. And they have 4,366 Federals within this area. Over on this side here, just these units, this is part of McDowell's Corps, and they have a total of 9,452 men. That means combined, the Federals have 13,818 men just on this part of the battlefield. Now, moving against them in this little area here, this is the force with which the Confederates were hoping to get around their flank and cut the turnpike itself. Well, they've only got 1,527 men with this force here. And if you add up all of the other men, mostly just Jackson's division, which is moving around McDowell's right flank, it equals just 5,818 men. So combined, the Confederates are moving just 7,345 men. So obviously, this is a problem moving forward for the Confederates as they run out of steam and more Federals move against their attack. But what's going on? I mean, they've had so much success with so many fewer men than the Federals have had. Well, there's a few things. First off, momentum. The Confederates have had the momentum in this battle ever since early morning. And when you have that momentum behind you, it becomes increasingly difficult for your opponents to stop you. I think that's what's going on here. The Federals are just back on their heels, and they've really not been able to stop them at all during this battle. Also, the terrain. Because of the heavily wooded, hilly area that they're fighting in, the Federals have no idea just how many Confederates they're actually fighting against. So when they see another line coming through the woods continuously, it's understandable that they believe they're fighting far more men than they actually are. Lastly, morale. Morale does play a role in these games. We are human after all. And I think the Federal commanders have been pushed back for so long in this game that they almost believe the worst is always going to happen whenever they're in the battle. And it is contagious. If you start believing you're going to lose before you even fight the battle, well, then you're probably going to lose. So despite the fact that they have far more men, 
than the Confederates do, it still seems that the momentum, the terrain, and the morale is all on the Confederate side. But let's actually take a look at the numbers here now that we're at the end of this episode. For the Federals, they are 48% of the way to their loss limit, while the Confederates are just 29% of the way to their loss limit. Pulling up the Confederate order of battle, you can see, shockingly, they've only lost 4,680 men. And really surprisingly, both Longstreet's right wing and A.P. Hill's center wing have lost under 1,000 men. And that seems crazy, considering they've been fighting all day and how much ground they've taken. What else is interesting is that Jones's division has yet to take a single casualty. The Confederates have been fighting this battle with anywhere from 15,000 to 20,000 fewer men than the Federals ever since the battle began, mostly because Jones's division was detached to the southern part of the map, guarding the Confederate bases. They do have Drayton's Brigade, which is working its way north, but they are still a number of hours from actually reaching the fighting. The main Confederate losses have come from Jackson's Corps, which has been engaged heavily with McDowell's all throughout the day. For the Federals, they've lost a total of 8,537 men. By far, the least affected has been Banks's Corps, which has lost just 451 men, none of them from Williams's 1st Division, which has been, I don't want to say engaged, because I guess they haven't been, but has been around Aldi ever since the battle began. The majority of their losses have come from the 1st and 3rd Corps under Siegel and McDowell, which have been fighting to defend the Gilbert's Corner on the Federal left flank. So my unasked for two cents about everything that's been going on here. Well, for the Confederates, let's start with them. They need to keep up the pressure. They've done a really good job so far of just putting the pressure all along the Federal line. And it's really paid dividends as they've been able to push them back really to within a half mile of Gilbert's Corner and Aldi. If they continue to do this, eventually the Federals will break somewhere and they'll be able to win this battle. And if they are able to win the battle, it will be pretty surprising because they are outnumbered everywhere. And not by a little. But the Yanks just don't seem to know that. They continue to treat the Confederate Army as if it's a equal force or a larger force when in reality... They're fighting with about 15,000 fewer men at this point along the front lines. And a general attack on Gilbert's Corner should really be considered right now. And as I said before, the momentum is with them, the terrain is on their side, and the morale is definitely with the Confederates at this moment. So it is an ideal time to launch a main attack on Gilbert's Corner. For the Federals, they just need to stop the Rebels. There's really nothing else I can say at this point. They're backed up. They have nowhere else to go. They just need to stop retreating, dig in, and start fighting. Also, for the Federals, they need to stop being bullied. They've been pushed back across this map, really, ever since the morning began. And they have to hold on somewhere. They've got to find a line that they can defend and stop letting the Confederates just push them around the map. They need to stand up to them and fight them and give them a bloody nose somewhere. And that just means they have to hold on. They have to find a line, finally, that they can defend and stop the Confederates. If they don't, this battle's going to be over pretty soon. What am I looking forward to in the next episode? Well, will the Yankee numbers ever be felt? As I mentioned, they still outnumber the Confederates by about 15,000 men along the front lines. But it doesn't seem like that. So will the Yanks ever be able to get their superior numbers into a position to affect the Confederates and drive them back? Will Jackson succeed in isolating Banks? I'm really curious about this. If he can reach that turnpike, there's every reason to believe that they can isolate Banks' entire corps and capture Aldi. So is the end coming? We're going to have to wait and see. It feels like we're getting towards it, but if the Federals are finally able to stop the Confederate advance, there's a chance it might stall out and the Confederates will finally have to attack across open fields, which is something they've been trying to avoid ever since the battle began. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like on here. 
and be sure to check out the next episode a little later on. Thank you.